This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. During the pandemic, we've been recording remotely and releasing extra episodes. Today's guest is one of my favorite contemporary songwriters, Angel Olsen, whose fifth album, All Mirrors, was a highlight of 2019. Two of that album's singles have recently been remixed by Johnny Jewell and Mark Ronson. We recorded this conversation in mid-May, and I reached Angel at her home. Hello. Hey, it's Joe. Hi, how's it going? Okay, how are you? I'm okay. Just uh, playing some guitar, you know. Uh, I have to review old records um, for projects that I'm working on. I'm doing like um, an entire album of Halfway Home, Strange Cacti, another one that's like a different project. So I'm, I have like 35 songs, 40 songs to to sort of reacquaint myself with because I've been playing with the band for a while. So they would all be solo. How does it feel? Um, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag, you know, sometimes hearing old recordings, it just reminds me of like, just in a way how far I've come, but also how different I used to be and what the styling, the things that I listen to, the way that I sang, the way that I approach singing is totally different now. Um, but how to like create or make those songs in performance close to that while also being who I've become now. <laughs> it's a little weird. Yeah. Right. It's, it's kind of like one of the few contexts where we do that. It's not like we go and read our old papers from high school or college and yeah. <laughs> recite them in front of people. Yeah, I guess that's just uh that's just the uh the consequence of trying to make your writing important is that then it does become important and then people want to hear it the way it was written, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um maybe, you know, for me it's like I I've been writing in this creative stage and also like I've just, yeah, I've just been writing a lot of new songs, but I have to do this project. So I have to kind of like try not to get too excited about the new, like a uh, creative process that means writing and instead just um, focus on old stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it can be fun to, to revisit old stuff too and be reminded of just like where I was when I wrote it, you know. What's the biggest difference that you've noticed as far as um, where you were when you made those earlier recordings and who you are now? Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> I didn't, I had, had no idea. I didn't even like, I wasn't like a person on the internet. Uh, I didn't really, I had opportunities recording with friends who had studios. And I mean, studios as in like, they recorded in their basement and called themselves producers, you know. <laughs> um, but I never really liked those experiences. I just, for some reason, I always liked the way things sounded when I could control them and when I could um, just sort of do them myself, which kind of limited me being able to be like exposing my music because at the time, you know, I guess everybody was trying to get their music exposed through working with a certain person or creating a certain sound. But I just kind of wanted to capture the songs the way that I've that they were um, when I performed them. And so I just ended up doing them on tape because it felt so low key. 
and I didn't think anything of it. Like I, I didn't have plans to tour or, you know, I, I had no big dream of like, oh, I'll, I'll definitely play music for a living someday. It was more just like, I'm going to play music no matter what else I have to do to do it. You know, that was the mindset. So, and now it's like, it's like, man, am I going to ever do anything else but play music for a living? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, one interesting thing to observe is that, um, you know, what your life has unfolded to up until now was unforeseen at that time. And so who knows what will be happening in another few years. I know. Yeah. Especially with all this time that every, everyone, um, including myself, has now to reflect. And that can go in different directions. You know, people that I know are, you know, a lot of people that I know are going through big changes right now because they're realizing what they actually need in life because of what's happening in the world. And it's, I don't know, I think that in some ways it's made, um, yeah, made some positive effects on the people around me. Um, but are you realizing what you really need? Um, I, you know, I get really bad post-door depression. Um, not, and, and that's, I'm saying that in like, uh, I don't love tour. Like, I don't particularly love to tour records. If it were up to me, I would just nerd out in a studio with somebody and like make songs and put out records and like maybe go on a tour every now and then. But <laughs> Um, I do enjoy performing with people that are in this lineup and, you know, it's a bummer to me that it got, you know, my, my record got like sort of cut in half when it came to performing the cycle. But at the same time, um, it's allowed me to realize how grateful I've been to like be, get, get to this point, you know, um, with myself and just being able to, um, create something where I can have like six or seven people on stage with me, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, sometimes I was telling my partner the other day, I was just like, you know, it doesn't matter how many records I put out. It's not really always, f I mean, it's nice that I have an audience and I'm really happy to have an audience, <laughs> but they're not always for the audience, you know? <laughs> and at the same time, are they ever for the audience? I don't think so. But, you know, like, I, it helps to have an audience to encourage you to continue, obviously. Right. <laughs> but I'll say, And like, you choose to release it into the world. You don't just keep it for yourself. Yeah. But now it's kind of flipped where it's like, do I have it? Like, what is real? Do I have an audience? Do people really listen? Like, are people listening to my music? You know, and it's really easy to get into that reality when you're not out there performing and seeing people reacting to it you know or or feeling like the actual physical like reaction of people to to what you're doing you know um so yeah i don't know it's a uh, it's a very weird reflective time and it's up and down you know sometimes i'm like well maybe maybe i'm i'm supposed to do something else eventually but yeah not right now <laughs> um I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I've always enjoyed writing in general, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you mentioned that you're writing new material. Lots of the folks that I've spoken to in the last couple months have experienced kind of like an inertia when it comes to writing new material amidst a global pandemic. Is it slowing <laughs> you down at all? Um. You know, for me, when I write anything, it, it comes and goes. I'm not a person who usually, you know, until, unless it's like I've already got a bunch of songs that I've recorded that year or demoed that year, I usually don't like sit in a, in a part of my house and write, write song after song, you know. The other day I wrote a song, I had a dream about a couple of parts of a song and I woke up at like 7.30 and recorded the whole thing, you know, and I was like done. I was like, wow, don't know where the frick that came from, but, um, you know, other songs, I guess, have been completely different than that, like piano-based or, you know, and it's always kind of been scattered no matter what. I don't think that this period of time or the the 
um, current state of the world has anything to do with the changes in my writing. I think for, for me, um, when it first started, I was like, oh, I'm really disappointed that I can't take the band on tour and this is really upsetting and how long is this going to last? And then I started to um, kind of feel like I could re finally reflect on some of the time that I needed to um, get back from all the years of touring, <laughs> you know, um, and just like reflect on things that haven't been reflected on because I've just been going and always having to be present in the moment for the next thing. Um, so in some ways, I think, yeah, that reflection time can allow somebody to write more. But for me, I also, I, I don't know, I think I'm in a period of where, like, I'm in the middle of a record, and I was focusing on that record and making space for that more than making space for writing. And so it's a little, it's it's like a weird thing to juggle. Like, when do I get ready to go back out there? And by the time I go back out there, will I have two records more, <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. I was supposed to be on tour this week and, you know, I was supposed to have a record that came out earlier this year and I'm like, oh, well, might as well just write another record. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people will be in that boat. I mean, you know, for me, I know there were a few more tours left for all mirrors and then festivals and everything just kept with managers in our f circle of friends, you know, like we call every day and it'd be like, okay, September okay now October <laughs> you know okay spring festivals we'll just do the festivals next year you know like um so I don't I don't really know what's happening but um with music right now and so I think the most positive thing to do is to focus on what I'm grateful for and also just continue to try to write stuff for the future and for yeah, just for myself, for exploring new territory, exploring stuff that I didn't really have time to do, you know, before when I was busy on the road. Um, but I've also trying, I'm also trying not to force it. I mean, you know, my partner's been like, we just got like a bunch of plugins and they are like going through all their new plugins and experimenting with audio stuff. And we're both kind of in different. <laughs> different worlds as far as like they're like super in demo world and I'm like I'm just kind of messing around here and there and um it's nice to be like with somebody who's doing that as well and um yeah I don't know kind of learn from learn a few things while I'm in my off time um but yeah I don't know I've mostly been reading a lot I've been reading a lot of um, different books and I really want to I want to hear something like I I was telling them yesterday I was like I want to hear something that's like gonna blow me away from like the 70s that some as some like forgotten gem that you know some some label like numero just reissued that you know I just want to hear something that's old and like a nugget of synth music or you know I, and then I started to play Kuro Shakmai, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. He's like a um, pre-revolution Iranian um, psychedelic singer. And they, I think, I don't know who reissued that record, but um, I was like, yeah, I want to I want to hear stuff like this. Like, I want to find something inspiring and new and, or new in the sense of like being you. found. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I'm just like, every, I've just heard everything. And I hate, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to hear, hear my own voice, really, and I don't want to hear new indie music. <laughs> I want to hear like something that like will blow my mind, like hearing Rodriguez for the first time, you know, <laughs> like what the frick is this? Um, but in the meantime, I'm just kind of, I don't know if you know that feeling as a musician or as somebody who makes music, just feeling like, man, I just, I've listened to this record so many times, I just need something really, really to just like blow me away. You know, and until that happens, I'm just going to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting position because, um, to a certain extent, it's the listener's responsibility to seek out something to blow them away. Um, yeah. But if you, I don't know. But on the other hand, sometimes you're just fatigued and you need to read a book. Yeah, for sure. 
I mean, this I whole podcast started because I was on tour and I couldn't listen to music anymore when I was going from place to place. My ears were totally fatigued and I just didn't feel anything when I heard music. So I started listening to podcasts. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think it's healthy to go through that phase. I'm in that phase right now. So I know that it will be over eventually. It's just like, I'm in the gathering phase or the, like, not necessarily of music, but of other kinds of gathering. Like, oh, maybe I'll read about surrealist photography for a while. <laughs> you know, or I'll, I'll just get really into plants right now. <laughs> Are you gardening? Um, you know, I have a bunch of plants that I'm just trying to keep alive now that I'm here. I'm not really a gardener because I know that it'll all go to shit when I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm doing like home, you know, home renovation stuff, like just kind of like checking in on my, on my house and like stuff around my house. And I don't know, going, I feel like an old person right now because in Asheville, it's pretty mild. I mean, everyone is following protocol, but it, uh, it feels maybe it's cause it's just like woodsy. You have a little bit more space to be a person during this time, but I mean, it's just like, I still go on a walk once a day, have my oatmeal for breakfast, have my coffee, read a little bit of the news before it drives me crazy and I can't read it anymore. And then like play a little music, work on something, do a house project, go on another walk, make dinner and go to sleep, you know? And it's like the same thing every day. And I'm like, who am I? Who am I becoming? <laughs> but isn't but tour like kind of the same thing every day too? It's true. It's, yeah. And it's not necessarily, at least this version is healthier, you know? <laughs> it's like, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not like, part, not every night is like a, a birthday party, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I can finally like get my like health back in order, take my vitamins daily, you know? <laughs> but yeah. Um, so you grew up in St. Louis, right? I did. I was there until I was 19 or 20. I can't remember. I think, I think 20. Were your parents musical people? They were not. Um, my biological parents were musical. My mom was, she played violin and, and my dad and her were like Hare Krishnas and played, <laughs> they like played music all the time, but I didn't grow up with them. So, but later found out that you know, my mom's side of the family was especially musical. So that was cool to find out. Um, but no, I was, I was always pretty into music as a young kid. And then my mom, my adoptive parents paid for piano lessons and would encourage me to record and write. And they bought me like a little tape recorder and I got really into overdubbing harmonies when I was young and doing like tape demoing, um, which I think helped me learn how to sing more because I could hear what I was, what I would sound like immediately and then redo it over and over again. You know, um, I still have a bunch of tapes from that time. Do you remember how it felt to listen to yourself back early on? Yeah, I just remember, I remember feeling, um, feeling like, oh, I can't wait until I have like an adult voice. <laughs> <laughs> Because I had like a kid's voice, um, you know. But I, I also would record in the bathroom a lot. Or like I grew up in this old Victorian house and the upstairs rooms were connected with a hallway. Um, it like it was like a separate doorway that you could open the door in between the rooms. And the hallway was taller than the rooms themselves. It was kind of random. But anyway, I'd sit in that little um, doorway and record in there because the the reverb, the natural reverb was really nice in there. Um, yeah. I don't know. I remember being like, I never did my homework. I would stay up till two in the morning doing stuff like that. <laughs> you know? Um, I you mean, was, even back when you had a kid's voice? So presumably, I mean, I must have young. been like, I must have been like, thir like 13 or 14. Yeah, I would stay up late. <laughs> Do you still stay yeah. up late? You know, if I'm alone, I have those nights where I, where I'm like, 
cool. I'm I'm gonna go for it tonight and get into this like guitar stuff and and stay up. But I don't know. I I try to I try to go to like at this point I'm on a schedule and I just fall asleep early because there's not a lot keeping me up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I used to be a person who like if I you know when I lived alone and when I was alone a lot I would stay up late. When did you start playing in front of people? Mm, maybe 16. I played on the street a lot. <laughs> I would play in front of this record store called Vintage Vinyl and play like Bjork covers or like <laughs> random. So I don't know. I was like really into, um, I was really into uh, Ezra Ray and Bjork and like just like random stuff at the time. Um, I think I listened to broadcasts a lot. I, yeah, just I someone had introduced me to indie music through like a CD or something. Um, we had this website I talked about um, a little bit before. Um, we we had a website that was like Facebook or like MySpace, but it was for St. Louis called STL Punk, and um, it was designed kind of similarly. There was a chat on the side. You could see who was online. Um, everyone who had a profile, you could you could list what your band was or your favorite bands. And then those, you'd click on the bands and they'd show you on a calendar where they're playing, whether it's a house show or a DIY show or art gallery, Lemp Art Center, or someplace in St. Louis. And um, I would meet other kids at shows, at all ages shows from all over the city. Um, and so I got to know a lot of different kids who went to, you know, high schools in the county or whatever who liked the same music and would meet them at these all ages shows. My mom would like drop me off and, you know, at that time I had like a flip phone and I would use it to call her, <laughs> you know, to like to pick, pick me up. up or whatever. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, I can't believe my mom let me do it because there was, there are places called, I think, I don't know if it's still open. There was a place called the creepy crawl. <laughs> it was like, there was like a barricade. It was like a cage for adults, and the adults were in the cage by the bar, and the kids were would go around the cage <laughs> to watch the show. It was weird to keep weird the kids spot. away from the bar. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't sound very um, safe, like fire. Code yeah, wise. no, probably not. I don't know. I don't know if there was anything safe about the creep crawl. Like, if you drove there, your car would. Uh, be broken into so most kids were dropped off and if you played there you just crossed your fingers that nothing was stolen while you were playing because it was in just like a really sketchy area do you feel like Um, you were welcomed into that all ages scene as a performer yeah i mean i was like um you know, I performed a little bit solo, but I was in like a, I was also in like a, um, like a ska band called Good Fight. It was like ska rock. And, uh, um, we played, yeah, we played a couple places called, we played Creepy Crawl and the High Point. We played, I think we played at Mississippi Nights before it closed. Um, for like a battle of the bands. It was like 80 bands. Sounds like a freaking, sounds like a nightmare. I mean, <laughs> did it feel like a nightmare know? at the time? I think, I think it was, it was a nightmare. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it was also like a contest of battle of the bands and then you could play, you know, opening the show of this other local artist. Like, I don't, I don't remember who it was, but it was like, we were all hoping to like win it. You know, we were a pretty good band for a high school band. Um, but I I remember, yeah, just getting into darker music and more more like songwriter based stuff and just I decided to quit the band and start doing that. And it was harder to play solo folk music, I feel like. I was getting into that kind of stuff and it was just like not really resonating with the scene I was in. Um most of the kids by that time were into like noise music and like um, you know, we'd go see battles or we'd go see like early Ariel Pink. Um, trying to think of like what else we would go and see. But yeah, I, I, there was like, there was just always some band that was like pretentiously called like 
uh, like, you know, like worm noise or like, it would just be like, okay. And then like these like high school kids or like early college kids, like reflecting on the noise music. And I just found it to be like kind of pretentious, but you mean like the people <laughs> in the audience, you didn't think they were actually enjoying it. They were just, I, I, it was hard to, I, I, I couldn't understand it. Cause I'm like a, I like noise, but I like a balance of melody and noise. So I don't know, maybe they were really into it. Um, Maybe that that's maybe in some way it was representative of some aggression that they that they felt. So, but at the time, I just I also knew a lot of those people personally and felt that they were just pretentious in general. So like, like you were just listening to my ska band six months yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, dude. Now you're listening to Ghost Dice. Okay, you're cool. You know, but um, you know. It also, I'm really happy, like, and proud of being part of that scene because the noise scene, like, led me into further, like, exploring music and trying other, like, different kinds of textures out and hearing, trying to listen to different things. But, um, I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was a weird time. I mean, St. Louis doesn't have a huge music scene, but I think that that, time period that that site being like 16 17 going to shows it just felt cool to be able to do that you know you just felt like you had a secret to be able to do that you know yeah i grew up in milwaukee which is a similarly sized city and uh, has i think a similar music scene and i feel like growing up in a, a town like that made me better at hunting for music that resonated with me for sure yeah yeah um so after you turned 18 what did you do um i'm trying to think of what i did when i was 18 God, i don't know i think i i still i played music opening for different bands in town at the limp art center um, that was a place that was like a regular spot. Um, um, uh, I was, I became friends with this band called floating city and they were like really big in St. Louis and all the girls loved them, you know? And then I met this girl, Grace, who was dating the lead singer and her and I became really good friends. And then we just started like learning about other music shows, like different, different kinds of, um, more like lower tempo rock and roll, like folk kind of stuff and how shows that would be putting those things on. And I had some friends that did like a basement show and um, booked all these Chicago musicians and I played a few songs and they were all like, it was like my first show in front of people who were from out of town, you know? So it was like really, for me, it was really exciting. Cause I was like, this is the test, you know? <laughs> Because St. Louis people have all, they've all heard me. They don't care. Whatever, you know. <laughs> but um, people in Chicago were like, you should come and play a show here for New Year's. Or you should come play a show here sometime. And a few years later, I ended up doing that. And it, it was really fun. And I decided, you know, there's a scene there I want to explore. And so I, um, so I, decided I had it in my mind to move there and I moved there by the time I was 20. Um, uh, I had signed up for massage therapy school at the Soma Institute. It was, uh, it was, um, you know, like a, um, how do I explain it? Like a sports massage, um, chiropractic massage mainly like, uh, school that was like two years long and I was like oh that sounds easy I'll do that and then I can convince my parents that it's a good idea that I move and go to the school and then I can play music also so it's <laughs> kind of um I really just wanted to play music in Chicago and I didn't really need to go to the school but I thought well if I'm gonna be a musician and I want to play music seriously there's no way I'm gonna like make a living off of it at first so I've got to like figure out what I'm gonna do on the side to make money, you know, and I thought that that was wise. So I did ended it up turn out to be wise. Uh, I ended up going to school for about a year and a half and then I quit. <laughs> Wait, you only had six months to go when you quit. <laughs> I know. I know. It was terrible. It's terrible. 
But um, how do you make a decision uh, like that? Are you a pretty instinctual person when it comes to those kinds of decisions? Um, well, I had visited Chicago. So in between that time of meeting the people, the kids that had played in St. Louis, I had been to Chicago a few times, um, with friends and really liked it and played a show there. And so I was like convinced that I would have like a few people, or at least I knew of a play, a few venues or, um, house, uh, pl- you know, DIY house show places that were like, they would either book me or I could go attend a show and and eventually meet people. And I felt safe knowing that. Um, And I had like three or four friends that I, I wasn't super close to, but I knew there. So I didn't feel like it was totally crazy, but it was, it was a leap. I just was, um, I was determined to not be in St. Louis for the rest of my life. I think that that determination pushed me more than um, the fear of it not working out in Chicago. So, um, for me, I I think I just needed to, I needed to go out into the world and get away from, you know, get away from like the person I was growing up or like that small town feeling like I wanted to see what was out there. Um, I felt like St. Louis was depressing, uh, at the time. I don't know. Sometimes when I go back, I still feel the same way. And like, I don't know how. Like, I think it's a beautiful city, and I think culturally it's changed quite a bit since I've left, and there's a lot more music there and art there than there was when I was growing up. Um, and I'm proud of people who stayed and made it what it is now, but, like, for me, um, yeah, it was just really depressing. And I felt like, yeah, I just felt like if I didn't leave, I would be stuck in the same cycle that many of my friends were, you know, some family members, you know, it's just like you go to college, then you get married, then you have kids and you live on the street that you were, you live down the street from where you grew up. You know, (laughs) I just didn't want to go into that cycle. I wanted to like play music and I didn't have that mind in my mind. Like I didn't, I wasn't like trying determined to get married and have a family. I wanted to make music and, and do that instead. Um, Do you see the two things as mutually exclusive? I think at the time I did. Um, and now I'm like, you can do both, obviously. But at the time, I just was so afraid of becoming part of the cycle, you know. And I think a lot of friends who left too, we we discussed that. Um, I have a fr- my friend who who I became really close friends with um, early on, who showed me the folk music scene, lives in New York and has lived there for ten years, and goes back to St. Louis and loves it, you know. But um, is happy to have left at the same time. You know, as somebody who grew up in the Midwest and left, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's there's something charming about going back. Um, and I love seeing the architecture and the old brick and the and re, you know, everything looks super old. And I notice things that I didn't. Everything looks smaller. You know, I don't know if that experience happens to you. But when I went when I go back, everything, it's like all the buildings that used to be so big and like I used to look at so wide eyed just seem so small now. I just think all the people look so small and I just feel so much more yeah. accomplished and better than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I loved Chicago. I loved, go- I loved, you know, sort of growing up there and, and discovering myself in music there. But now when I go back, I'm like, man, where are the freaking trees? <laughs> like, where are the trees? I don't see any trees. There, oh, there's a tree. It's at a park, you know? It's like perfectly, you know, perfectly put in this park. <laughs> wait, so you, and, wait a second, though. We, we were talking about massage school. Yeah. You got so three-fourths I, of the way through, so you must still be pretty good at giving massages. Yeah, but we don't tell people about that because <laughs> the moment they know... Then I'm like, you know, I told one person in the band once, bad idea. Somebody's got an injury. They call me. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't do that. Well, a lot of the teachers also, um, that were teaching at that school, which maybe it was their own, you know, their, their their own version of practice, but had developed like carpal tunnel syndrome. And I was like, no way. If I get that, it's from playing guitar, not from like giving some 
a bunch of people massages. Like I'd love to help people, but I'm not going to break my wrist for um, the human body right now. <laughs> like I, I knew in myself, I, like I, I figured out that I wasn't a person who had the, I, I didn't have the ability to just like completely put my heart and, and soul into that work. And it wasn't for me, you know. You're a crazy acrobat You're the witch, I am your cat I want to be a bit like you I hope you don't mind If I do I love the way your body's made I love the way your voice is sex to be the whisper upon your ear I thought you know um massage school's not for me and I I need to find out what is because I I still I still felt that I there was a need to do something other than playing music too but I just didn't know what that was yet. And I was like 21, 22 at the time. So I was working at a cafe in the meantime and, and playing shows at these different um, spaces and didn't have I had no idea like what was going to happen. I was in this sort of interim period. Did you know what you wanted to happen? Yeah. I mean, ideally it would have been great to play music um, to like be, you know, to perform enough to play, you know, I wasn't playing at like big venues there. I was playing at house shows at the time. And I played like, maybe I opened at Lincoln Hall or maybe I opened at a few places, like opened a few shows. Uh, But I think, I think I played at Ronnie's, which was like really tiny, kind of smelled like urine. And I opened for a bunch of people Underage, I, I don't think I was supposed to be playing that show. But, like, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And I knew if I wanted to continue playing music, I'd have to keep working really hard at it. I had no idea that I would be, um, you know, in a matter of a few years, I'd be working as a backup singer in someone's band. And then, like, a few years later, I'd be putting out records of my own and touring on my own. I had no idea that that would happen. And it wasn't. I didn't have, I didn't have a car. I wasn't able to, I I don't think I had a license anymore at the time. Um, I was just riding my bike everywhere. I never went on, you know, never tried to get a band together. Um, Friends of mine were in bands and they'd go on these tours and they'd play like five shows in a state, you know, (laughs) just like different parts of each state and play a few colleges to make a little bit of money. Um, And I wasn't at that point. I didn't have a group of people to help me and I just didn't know how to do it. So I was just kind of, I'd ride my bike with like a little, uh, I had a, I have like a, a little ZT lunchbox amp and I would put the amp in the, in the basket of the bike and show up and play. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I didn't have like a, I wasn't trying to get a booking agent. I wasn't trying to get signed or anything, you know? It's hard to know if it's even constructive to, you know, really have a plan because like, like you said, it doesn't really work out that way. It it kind of just unfolded rather than something that you conceived and executed step by step. Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, I think specifically a lot of bands who have worked for like 10 years on the road and they finally like, like clicked with an audience after, you know, being on tour for a really long time. I think that there's probably something that's like, what did we do different? You know, was it the, was it, was it the producer we worked with? Was it because, you know, was it just like a slow natural thing or, um, but yeah, for me, it wasn't really that calculated. I think I just happened to have a a light shown on me a little bit because I was singing in someone's band who was already pretty well known. And then, um, whose bands were you singing in? So I sang, I sang backup for Will Oldham for two or three years. Um, and sort of got to experience traveling and the world and what it means to 
perform with several people through that experience so that when it was time for me to take the leap for my own music, you know, I kind of already had an understanding of how that went, you know, from just watching it happen. How did you meet Will? Um, well, somebody, so I, so I was at a show and someone introduced me to his guitarist at the time, Emmett Kelly, and Emmett and Ben Boy, who played keys, lived together, and um, Emmett had showed him Strange Cacti, I think, and said, I think that, because I think at the time Will was looking for a singer to sing all these, um, he wanted to do a cover band for Kevin Coyne and Dagmar Krauss, and I would sing, or he was looking for someone to sing the, the Dagmar Krauss songs, um, and so yeah, kind of a random cover band, but I think he just loved Kevin Coyne, and he loved that record, Babel, and so he wanted to do a thing where he opened as the cover band, and then at night played Bonnie songs, or, or Bonnie Prince Billy songs. So I um, sent him some stuff, some versions of my of what I did on Dagmar Krauss, and then he was like, let's try it out, let's do a tour, and so we played... We played a show, a warm-up show in Chicago, and then did a did like a ten-day tour, and it was like a three and a half hour set because it was like an hour for that record, the cover record, then a thirty-minute break, and then you know an hour fifteen, hour thirty for Bonnie Prince Billy songs. So I learned like a bunch of his catalog, and then the 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 Babblers, whatever the Babble set. So. um it was quite a bit of work, but it was really fun, and then I continued on with them. I didn't, I didn't have any idea if it was just a one-time tour or not. But um, then we just continued singing together for a few more years, and that's when I worked on Halfway Home um, with Emmett, who had produced that record. What was the impetus to make that record? To make um, Halfway, Halfway Home. Home? Well, I had still... So Strange Cacti came out on tape, and then it did well while I was on tour with Will. And surprisingly, we decided to do like an LP of that. And then I was encouraged through that experience because it got a good review. And John Hensey, who put out that record, was just like, you, sh you know, you should do something with the other demos I know you're sitting on. And I, I had like four or five songs that I didn't put on Strange Cacti and four other, like, other songs that I had written while I was with Will. And I was like okay, I'm going to, it's time to put these out there because I'm already starting to write again. And so, it, yeah, it was mostly just like, if I didn't record it, I just didn't know if I was going to have time to, in the future, because I didn't know if I was going to be on tour or not with Will. So I was trying to get it done um, in the in-between months, in-between tours. Um, and then, and then, yeah, we went on a summer tour and, uh, at the end of that, I, I was like, Hey, I, I'm going to go on this, this run in, in Europe. I had started talking with a European agent who was interested in booking me. And my first solo tour ever was in Europe. Um, actually outside of like, I think I played, I did like a slew of New York shows after strange cacti came out. I did like four or five shows with a friend and still wasn't signed to anyone other than working with pathetic, um, and that was fun. Uh, it was weird to see people coming out to my shows um, because I'd never played anywhere other than Chicago and St. Louis. Um, so, so when I played in Europe on my first solo tour after Halfway Home came out, it was crazy to play in front of like, a, you know, at a festival in front of like 400 people. You know, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is insane. Um, so that was kind of affirming. And then I got home and um, John introduced me to Mark from Harvest Records, who lives in Asheville, and Mark and John booked this solo tour for me. Didn't have a booking agent in the U.S. yet, so, and then with the help of my PR agent, Jessica Linker, um, you know, she was like, people are going to come out of the woodwork, you should get an attorney, you should, you know, if you have any questions about labels, and then all of a sudden it was like, at the end of that U.S. tour, booking agents... <clears throat> Ban you know, booking agents, managers, 
publishers, <laughs> like everybody came out. It was like insane. You know, just two tours. <clears throat> Terrifying. <laughs> you know, how do you make the right decision? So I ended up going with people that I was familiar with. Um, I had like a really long dinner with Darius from JAG, and I think um, they had just lost um, uh, Songs of Haya guy. Um, and they just like, everybody was still mourning that situation at JAG. And I had my eye on, on Drag City, but I wasn't, it was like, even though I was more familiar with them, I wasn't sure if they were completely sold on me. Um, wasn't sure if that was like the right, the right fit, even though I liked Dan and, and I had friends that worked at Drag City and that was like a dream to be signed to Drag City, you know? Um, but yeah, I ended up going with Jag and feeling really right about that decision. Um, and yeah, and then all of a sudden it was like just a bunch, yeah, a bunch of people coming out of the woodwork. And um, luckily I had people who knew a lot of, you know, I had Jessica and I had, I had other sources around me that were helpful in helping me make decisions and talking about like what was best for where I was. Um, but yeah, it was, I feel very lucky. I don't think that that happens that way for most people. It feels really weird that it happened that way for me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I was just kind of wide eyed about it all. And I feel very lucky that there were people there to be like, here, don't be so wide eyed. Here's some information, you know? <laughs> and how did your life change? Mm. I mean, completely. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to work anymore. I didn't, I mean, when I was working for Will, I didn't have to work anymore. I remember being like, I don't want to work at this cafe. Like, it's humbling to have something that's not being on tour and it's nice to like check in with my myself and work with people who <clears throat> are just living, you know. And, you know, I remember getting back from tour from Will and people at the cafe would be like, Oh, the rock star is back, you know, just like, <laughs> and I just like, was like, man, don't be a shithead. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we're all just trying, we're all just trying to make it out there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's incredibly humbling to come back from a tour and not know if you're going to go on tour ever again with someone. And so, you're just, you might just be a dishwasher for a while now. And that happens. Is that happens. what you did at the cafe? I washed dishes and ran food and made smoothies and, yeah, and made coffee that probably wasn't very good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and I... Have you uh, been back there since you quit? You know, I haven't, but I really want to go back. <laughs> Maybe some of those people that taunted you will still be there. I hope so. <laughs> Do you? Well, one of would them, it really give you that much pleasure well, to to gloat? Yeah. Well, one of them that taunted me ended up being my drummer so, <laughs> for a long time. So yeah. So it turns out he <laughs> that person was just jealous. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those people, like we all, ended up working in some way in the music industry, you know. Um, but yeah. It's weird to think about just being a kid going to DIY shows and, you know, freaking. there are certain people that come through your basement that are just playing shows and then one day they're like, the biggest band <laughs> that you know. Right, yeah, I had a house like that. I lived at a house like that in Milwaukee and bands mm -hmm. like Modest Mouse played there. Yeah. And, and then the house itself became famous years later because it was the first house featured on the reality show hoarders some lady moved wow. in and was hoarding food in there <laughs> and some cool. of the stickers from the bands were still in the basement in the show amazing amazing yeah my friends you know um jeff the brotherhood and ty seagal had played in this uh Ottoman Empire is what it was called, <laughs> you know, like. That's quite just, a grandiose name for a basement place. I, know. I like it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, the person, my friend Carrie, who ended up, she she would run it, really. She, was, she ran a tight ship. She would wear, like, matching paisley print 
dresses with it was like always the same colors bright green bright red with like a hat with also the same colored shoes and just be like it's five dollars you can leave you know Mm. (laughs) you know like pushing people to pay something and now she's yeah i love her to death but she yeah she opened a cafe like literally across the street and all of the people that went to the shows at her house are now playing shows at the venue and cafe that she owns so you know it's I don't know. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how we all grow in different ways and what we've done with that time and how it wasn't completely fruitless, you know. No, I mean, I don't think anything is fruitless if you approach it with the right attitude. Yeah. But um yeah, I don't know. If you would have gotten signed to Jag the day you moved to Chicago or whatever, <laughs> maybe it wouldn't have worked out as well as if you had worked at the cafe for a while. Probably not. I think there's, you got to have a little bit of time of working, sweating, you know, making the wrong latte for the, you know, for the, for the angry person (laughs) for a while (laughs) to just really like pepper your life a little bit before you get to that stage. I think. I think it can also strengthen your sense of empathy. Yeah, for sure. Um, You were talking about songwriting a little bit before, and you mentioned that you're not the kind of person that writes on a schedule, like Nick Cave style, where you go into an office and force yourself to write every day. So um, how does it work for you? Um, You know, for me, it it kind of can happen at any time. Um, I'm sure that if I did force myself to write every day, I would write something, but I don't guarantee it would be good. And I think that part for me, part of writing is the stage where you're not writing and you are just listening to music or you're reading a book or you're reflecting on something. Like for me, I think that that's a big part of what I have to do in order to write. But um, yeah, I I can write on tour. I used to think that I wouldn't be able to. And um, sometimes it just happens, you you pick up a guitar because you're bored and you're playing something and all of a sudden it, it's like you come upon something and then you've written something, you know, and other times you get, you get this, this part sucks. It's like you start to write something, you like the melody and then you write filler words. And then no matter how hard you try, you can't get rid of the filler words and they just are haunting this, what would be a good song, but instead you've just, you've filled the song with nonsense or something that you know isn't good enough and and you just can't you can't like get that other thing out of there in order to put something else in there. And so it just sits on a shelf for a while until you can figure out how to forget the filler words. And that's like the that's the worst case scenario for me. <laughs> it's like being like, "Man, it's stuck." Or there's only two parts to the song and then you're just stuck, you know. Some so. good songs only have two parts though, right? That's true. You know, sometimes the best songs are really just three chords over and over again. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's confusing. <laughs> it is. There's, it's magic. You can't understand it, right? Yeah. I ain't hanging up this time. I ain't giving up tonight. You wish to still believe it's worth the fight I could make it all go away Tell me what you think and don't delay We could still be having some sweet memories This heart still beats for you, why can't you see it? Shut up, kiss me, hold me tight What do you think about most throughout the day? Um, what do I think about most? Um, I guess it varies, but yeah, I guess I'm just, um, I'm trying to, uh, not think so deeply about my entire life just because there is this, um, uh, amount of time now to do that. (laughs) Uh, but 
for me, I think, I think it's good. It's healthy to have a project or something to work on, even if it's not music to not com completely be, uh, idle in your thoughts, you know, cause it can, it can get, you know, a little murky in there if you overthink stuff. And I can, I tend to do that if I'm not writing and if I'm writing, I can go into writing and then it's useful. But if it's not writing, then I'll just end up like thinking about like what it, what is real? Is it, is my life real? <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> you know? <laughs> How would you answer that question? I mean, I think I'm just being bored when I, I, I think I just, I get bored with myself. I get bored with what I've already accomplished. Just like anybody who is always creating, you know, it's, it's hard to just like look at everything and say like, okay, I've done it now. You know, I always feel like there's something more to kind of understand or, um, there are ways to do it better or or I just, I completely develop a different style and, and, and want to explore that for a while. Um, but yeah, right now I, I have to really, I have to really force myself to focus on these old songs and, and finish, um, relearning them. And, you know, people are always asking like, so when you sing old songs, does it bring up old, like failures or pain or whatever? And for me, it's just more like, it brings up how old I was, you know, like I can just tell that I was young when I was like 20 and I didn't have any real problems, but I found ways to look at them to make them problems, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and so it's hard knowing that and knowing who I was to, to completely forget that when I'm singing it sometimes. And so, yeah, for me, it's 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 a challenge to kind of go back in the past and, and just force myself to view it as like an outsider and to get into it as an outsider. Um, sometimes I can do it. And when I've played on tour, when I'm playing in front of an audience, it's it's much easier to to play old songs. But there's nothing I hate more than practicing. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I, you know, when you could be writing something new and exciting, you know. Hmm. Do you feel like it drains your creative energy to practice? Um, not necessarily. I think, I think that sometimes it can lead to different avenues and remind you that you're capable of, you're capable of writing in different ways and to remind you that, um, you have done something, for example. <laughs> Right, which is something that you can forget. Sometimes when you've made a record and you're starting your next one, it almost feels like you've forgotten how to do it. Yeah. I think, yeah, especially, you know, this last record for me was incredibly difficult to make because I did it twice. And then, you know, the full band, full orchestra version was coming together piece by piece. And it was really difficult to imagine how it would all sound and when it came to get together, you know, and I'm, what I realized about myself is that I, it's, it's really difficult for me to let go of, you know, the process and let, and trust the process. But luckily I was working with someone I'd already worked with and who I knew was a you know, incredible mixer and editor and, you know, John Congleton. Yeah. It's cool to like also have made two records with him. One when I was just up and coming and now one that, you know, after years of playing with a band and like touring the world and seeing the difference and seeing the difference in our relate, the way we talk about music to each other, which I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it was sad that I didn't see him for so long and then, but it's cool to see the difference of our friendship and how we can work together. So he's a freak. I like him. <laughs> he's like, a do he can be really like detached and focused. And I think some people might misinterpret that about him, but um, it's because he's so focused in on what he's doing. And I like that. He's the kind of guy who just like n never changes his sweater or his shoes. 
He's just like all, every time I see him, it's like the, he's like the same person. <laughs> yeah, they say that really successful people wear the same outfit every day. Oh, really? <laughs> I should start doing like, that. I guess Barack Obama had the same suit, and the, and Steve Jobs wore his you know jeans and black turtleneck thing. Um, yeah. B- but the the idea is that you're not using your decision making energy towards what you're going to wear. Well, huh? I don't know if it's Curious. bullshit, but I've I've heard that. There's it's a theory. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to make him realize it if it's just like if it's just like a natural thing that he's doing. You know, I'd rather just not mention it to him. So. <laughs> Were you proud of the record when it was finished? Yeah, I mean, it was it was hard. I think it was I think I was um Yeah, I think I was really proud of it, but I was also exhausted and just kind of like I can't believe that this actually like this came together in this way, you know, because when I was imagining it I'd get a demo of MIDI file versions of strings, which is not true to how it will sound. And it's hard to be excited or emotional about MIDI strings. Um, so like, yeah, I was, I was impressed. And I know uh, my voice was competing with the strings a lot. So, you know, I think for, I think we did like f- six or seven, um, um, uh, what's it what's it called uh, i can't even press it like pressings like demo or first pressings because because the you know the strings were just like it was just like in crazy like crazy loud you know it was hard to i think it was hard to get it to where strings and my voice weren't competing all the time and to make it sound as full as it was when it was happening in the live room you know it, it's difficult but um i think he did an incredible job and yeah, I don't know. Especially from where the scratch, the scrappy demos that I came from, like, yeah, it's crazy to imagine how how it came together so lush, you know. If you were to go back in time and talk to your eighteen year old self, is there anything that you would want to tell her or ask her? I don't even know. These kinds of questions are hard for me. Yeah, I don't know. Just like, don't be afraid of the unknown. Go, f- you know, just go forward into the unknown and, ex- and see for yourself, you know? Because I think if I hadn't done that, and if I, if there was ever a moment where I just didn't take a chance, I, I don't think that I would have been able to play in Will's band or, you know, play live in general or, or move to Chicago. And even if I knew it was under, you know, it it was obviously like, oh, I don't think that massage therapy is my passion, but like, I knew that if I had a reason that wasn't music to move to Chicago, my my parents would be like, cool, we support you, and so I used what I could to get there, um, and I didn't doubt myself in that process, but I don't know, yeah, I guess I would have told myself, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would have told myself. Well, what you just said was very powerful. Yeah. Okay, what, we'll stick with that then. <laughs> so what does it mean to go forward into the unknown at this stage in your life? Yeah, I mean, you know, starting from like when I was a kid to like, you know, what it means to be somebody. It's like, you know, buying a house and like I wave to my neighbors and I'm like, who do I think I am? I feel like I've pulled something or like I've, I've pulled something over on everyone, you know? Like I don't feel like, like when am I going to feel like I'm a, a human adult? And I'm just like, I, I feel like everyone just, they just don't know that I, they haven't found me out yet, you know? <laughs> um, but I think that that feeling comes from, it comes from being a musician and comes from being somebody who always wants to explore and play and doesn't want to be settled completely in something or just completely, I don't want to be a person who is just a, you know, has the same exact routine every single day forever. You know, it's nice to have it for now because I need health and I need reflection in my life. But I think that there is a part of me that 
you know, wants to stir up something or wants to take from past experiences and, and still, you know, reconstruct them and make songs out of them and try to understand um, whatever thoughts that come through, whether or not they're actual feelings that I have or just thoughts passing through, like how to make them more interesting and turn them into songs, you know. Um, and part of me is like, when I was saying earlier, I want to be blown away. I mean, the reason why I want to be blown away is because I want to be inspired to want to do the thing that I'm doing, making music. I want, I want to wake up again, that feeling of waking up and feeling like, you know, when you watch like a rock documentary that you love or, and you're just like, man, I'm going to get the guitar out again. Like, I feel like I could do that. Yeah. I've been watching lots of rock documentaries during quarantine. Yeah. I don't, and, and, Maybe that would be helpful for me. I don't know. <laughs> well, <but. laughs> which ones do you love? Well, I started watching one on Fleetwood Mac, and I like had to stop because I just like Lindsey Buckingham just like annoyed me, so I just turned it off. <laughs> but I was like, I was like, okay, I I love this band so much, but I can't watch them talk about each other right now. It's not helping me. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think I think I need. Yeah, I think I need a specific kind of rock documentary maybe <laughs> um more music less talking about feelings <laughs> have you seen the um the concert that kate bush did in the late 70s the concert footage there was basically um, where, just where one, was it uh it was in london um, oh it was it at um uh, at hammersmith odeon maybe oh yeah we played there we played there this year um or it was a po- Hammersmith Apollo, I guess right. is what it was called. Yeah, that's a cool venue. I think that's where uh-huh. hers is. Anyway, that's the one that I've been watching, and it's mostly music. Wow. Okay, I'm so going to check it out. So that's a recommendation. It's, and I found I like it mind-blowing. Yeah. Okay. But when was the last time you had your mind blown? Oh, dude, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, probably not that long ago, actually. I'm just like, because there's no activity that uh, I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah. Just knowing that, that we're all the whole world, everybody's just like in the same place. And it's like, it's hard to go into that imaginative place and just be like, I'm feeling this thing and I want to express it. It's like, well, I'm feeling this thing and I want to express it, but for what cause, you know, (laughs) for for when, for when, right. Um, so I, I really have to battle with that a little bit, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess, mm, I'm trying to think when I was last, I sound so, I mean, I'm not saying that things aren't impressive to me. It's just, yeah, I guess I just need to see like a live performance that's incredible and be like super inspired, (laughs) just like anybody. You know. Well, who knows when that'll happen? I guess it's yeah. the new unknown. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll watch a live stream. <laughs> that we'll seems so sad. Have you played any um, live streams? I did. Um, I managed to raise some money for Music Cares and my band and crew, which was helpful. But you know, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a weird world to think about live streams for, for musicians for the next, however, a year, two years, you know? Um, but I, um, I'm not against them. I feel like, you know, getting audio and visuals to be a certain way is important. And, um, but you just have to think about all this stuff that as a performer, musician, it's just like, if you just go play a show, you wouldn't have to think about all that, but now you've got to do it all yourself, you know, which is a headache I think for a lot of people, but you know, we're working it out. We're just, we're out here learning things. So, (laughs) um, my friend got a green screen and we're like, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a music video green screen, but she's, she's, she has a radio show. And so I was like, you should get a little podcast going, like start talking on your radio show and, get some clouds in the background, you know, put yourself in Hawaii or the jungle or, you know, just go wild. 
but yeah, I don't know. Um, it's like a you just gotta you just gotta find the right um, sources of inspiration. Everybody does right now. So if you have any rock docs, please let me know about them. Angel, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Yeah.